Oh, okay, I see, I see. I see. I see. They put him out to pass. Yeah, right. Oh, so you two knew each other? No, yeah. No, you no, didn't know no, no. oh. They just met out there in the parking lot. We, I told him I was looking for a couple of girls, and he said he was too. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we Jim, what was your unit during World War II? I was in the Navy. We didn't have any particular units. Uh, what ships did you serve so on? I, I, uh, I went over to Guam, and I was supposed to go out by ship there, but I got appendicitis while I was there and had my appendix off. My uncle served in Guam, too, Earl Isaacson. I don't know what I mean. And he was in the Navy, too. I mean, the chances are, but you never know. I was at uh, uh, Navy 926, NOB Navy 926, it's after Harbor. After the Harbor? After, A-P-R-A, I believe, uh, I'm not sure how it's spelled, but Harbor. Oh, okay. That's where all the... <coughs> oh, okay. I was a uh, ship fitter. And what, I don't know what that, what is that? What is, what is that? What is what that? What is the ship? He repairs everything. Oh, okay. <laughs> Tries to <laughs> show it that way. Okay. And midnight requisitions. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when did you serve? 1945, 46. He served before I did. Okay. <laughs> Tell us about yourself, Bill. Or William, which do you want to be no, called? I'm just called Bill. Okay. People call me William. I said, they must be my creditors. <laughs> <laughs> my husband's named William, too, and he says, just plain Bill. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's what I That's what I used to write when she was my girlfriend. Then, and then she was my wife. I knew met her before the war. And uh, I just always signed it, just your Bill, you know. Yeah. What outfit were you in? Well, you mean, when do you want to know? Do you want to go from the beginning, or do you want to know World War II? Which do you want? Oh? <laughs> we don't know. You tell okay, us. all right. Well, I'll tell you my background. See, I was the sole support of my mother and my sister, who was 10 days old when my father died. This is before World War II. And jobs were scarce. Now we're talking 1937. So I uh, was doing odd things, but it wasn't enough to take care of my mother and my sister. So I heard there were jobs available up in the Tri-Cities, Moline, Rock Island, Davenport. So I came up here and I got me a job, making the grand total of eight dollars and a half a week, plus my board and room. So I took it because that eight dollars and a half was a lot more than I had, and I sent it home to mother. And in those days, you could get by because we did own the house down that they were living in. So then I was reading. No, this was in Rock Island. I was living in Moline at that time. I'd been reading about the Air Corps until I went over to talk to the Army Air Corps. This is in 37. I gave you the wrong dates. In 30, 30. I'm getting confused in my old age. When you get 87 years old, I think you're entitled to forget a few things. But anyhow, uh, I went over to the Army Air Corps recruiter. And, and because in those days, you would make, beside your board and room, you could make 50 bucks a month as a, a graphic first class, you know what I mean? Well, I told the, the man that I, the recruiter, I'd like to learn to fly. And the first question he asked me, he said, do you have a college education? I said, no. I have a high school diploma, but I have no college education. He said, well, you know, uh, you got, should have a college education to fly, but 
we do have a program. It's called the Flying Sergeant Program. Now, let me explain it to you to see if you're interested. You enlist in the Air Corps, and if you can pass the physical and the intelligence tests, we, we send you to flying school. Now, you learn to fly with the guys that have got the college education. And if you successfully pass basic, primary, and, and uh, sec secondary, and then uh, transition, and then advanced, you get to become a staff sergeant now. And the men that are your classmates have a college or commission as a second lieutenant. So, uh, hell, I wasn't worried about my intelligence or my ability to fly, so, okay, let's go, sign up, and off I go, so I could send more money home, see? Mm -hmm. And I went through flying school, and two weeks before graduation in 19, I was in, graduated in 38, January. Well, the there was the government cut the appropriations for the military you know we were, uh, cut back the army the navy the marine corps and the air corps so they called us all in they said now we got some good news now you guys because that now we were down from originally it was 40 we were down to 20 some odd guys left the rest of them got washed out I mean, if you got your shoes dusty, marching in damn dust in Texas, and the sergeant was mad for some reason or other, he might put you up on demerits and then too many demerits. <laughs> but anyhow, so they called us all in. They said, well, now we've got uh, some good news and we got some bad news. You guys are all going to get your wings because you passed all the tests. But you're not going on active duty. Oh, God, my heart went down. Because the government had got the appropriation now, but we're, what you've got to do, since the government invests all this money in you, you, you're being automatically transferred to the Air Corps Reserves, which means that you are going to have to come back every summer for two weeks for six years to fly for two weeks. Well... So my question was, well, what do I get, what I get paid? I think I get paid what the Gerag calls for in, during that period of time. Well, so I, I, I was really upset because now I had to find another job. <laughs> Did you know at this time that, that we were probably going to go into war or there was any rumblings at all about that? No, there was uh, no rumblings because, remember, see, 39 is when, when, he actually, uh, when, when uh, Hitler invaded. Well, there was rumblings that there could be some problems, but uh, we, of course, weren't alerted to it, and it wasn't too much in the paper. So anyhow, I go, <coughs> I go to summer camp on 39, go down as a staff sergeant, come up as a staff sergeant. 40, oh, anyway, it was 38, I went down as a staff. 39, I got to be a tech. And then 40, 41, yeah. 41, I made master. And these days get confusing. But anyhow, Pearl Har the Saturday before Pearl Harbor Sunday, my, my girlfriend, her brother was injured in a bad car accident in Galesburg, Illinois. So I'm down to Galesburg, uh, her and her folks because their folks were Angus breeders, Brown Brothers and Alita. They had two Grand International Champions out of their herd up there. Really? Brown Brothers and Alita? I have friends in Alita. Uh, well, you, you know uh, the apple orchard people. Weirs? Right. Huh? Weirs? Weirs. Yeah. Uh, they were very close friends. Mr. Weir Sr., I knew him, and I knew Mrs. Weir. Of course, she's gone now. But uh, I knew them very well. My parents, when they got married, they their first house that they lived in was on the Weir's fruit farm. <laughs> <laughs> well, then they had worked for them. Uh, they, uh, so, 
uh, I always had my future in-laws. I never got in-laws. I just got another mom and dad when I got married. But anyhow, um, we was at the hospital and we were listening to the radio about the Japs bomb in Pearl Harbor. And I said to Lena, I said, I probably get called. But that's then my phone rang. The phone on the room rang. My mother was on the phone. And she said, a telegram came just a little while ago that you're to be out of Marchfield, California, Wednesday. Okay, now I want to get this straight. Th what day did you get that call? My was that the day that Pearl Harbor got hit? Yeah. And they got stuff going that fast. Well, they had the reserves that get called out. Yeah, I know, but I mean, and it, they didn't have speedy telecommunications like we have now. No, there was telegram. Right. March or Marsh field? March. Like March, one, two, three, yeah. four. Okay, California. Yeah. And you had to be there on Wednesday. I think that's, that's amazing, you know, just that there would be that quicker response. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, but no, they, uh, the reason it was is because it's either we were always on ready reserve and don't forget right. I'd been flying and, right. and all of them. So anyhow, I said, okay. She said, I'll tell you what, I'll send them I'll put the stuff on the bus so you, air was not air mail and that kind of stuff wasn't in existence right. <laughs> or the train right. and get it shipped out to Marchfield so then I went down to Scottfield outside of St. Louis uh, to get a ride to fly to California and uh, they had a ship that was going out so there was no problem there so we get out to Marchfield and report in and walk in this building. There's a sign that says enlisted men this way and officer men this way. So I'm an enlisted man. So I, don't forget, I got no uniforms. I got no nothing. <laughs> I hadn't even got orders. <laughs> I haven't seen my orders. I go down and listen. And I, the sergeant sitting there, I said to him, Sergeant Compton, 1605, 1098, reporting for duty. He's going down the list. He says, I can't find any. Where's your telegram? I said, my mother forgot to send it to me. He said, excuse me, Mr. Sergeant. He runs over here where it says officers. He comes back with this guy, and they both salute. And I said, sorry, Captain Compton, 0571316. Captain <laughs> from Sergeant. <laughs> Jesus. So anyhow, we that's the way we started out. And then just, can I ask can I interject a question? Sure. Was it I'm just trying to get a picture was it just chaos in this building? You know, I mean I'm just trying to picture you. Oh, know, well, it was, no, I wouldn't call it chaotic. It was people were lined up and busy and running, you know what I mean. It was if you know you could say it was organized chaos. Mm-hmm. Lots and lots of people in. Oh, lots of people yeah. coming in. Oh, yeah, yeah. In fact, guys his age, oh, I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. <laughs> but anyhow. He doesn't know how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, not, uh, it, it, I can get pretty close. But anyhow, <laughs> so we get our plane, and off we go to Europe. Our, the, the next day? Three days. Three days. Where, where did you go to? Europe. We go to England. We so get, you flew, you flew over there, just flew, and you right. hadn't flown for how long, and then you're in a plane, and uh, away you go. Uh, no, I had flown in the summertime. I was all checked out on the 17s. Yeah. I was. Oh, okay. Uh, so you were on the B-17s. Yeah. B-17. Yeah. That's and what it is. Uh, then uh, we uh, we went from uh, I'll never forget. Uh, you've heard of the town of Grand Island, Nebraska? Right. Sure. Yes. Okay. <laughs> there was three of three seventeens that took off in March at the same time to go east. I, because of being the senior pilot and the group, I was the lead on, and the other two guys were flying my wing, and we were coming in. We'd gone over Cheyenne, yeah. And one of the guys in the other plane said, hey, let's veer off course. We were supposed to go down through Kansas City and then across. 
He said, let's go off course. He said, I'm from Beatrice, Wyoming. And he said, I'd like to go because I told my folks if I'd ever fly over Beatrice, I'd swing by. <laughs> Don't you love it? Beatrice, Wyoming or Nebraska? Huh? Beatrice, Wyoming or Nebraska? Be Beatrice, Nebraska. Uh -huh. Beatrice. Beatrice. Yeah. My son-in-law corrects me all the time. It's Beatrice, right. <laughs> and uh, so we get, so he says, let me take the lead. So I drop back onto the wing and he takes the lead. And we're going along, and he's jabbing along, and there he says, Gee, there it comes. I'll never forget, it's a white church in the middle of that town. It's got a tall spire. In those days, I don't know if it's still in the Is it still in the I don't know. It's a, big, it's a bigger place now. <laughs> but anyhow, it's got a really fancy library, I know So that. we got, he said, get in the tail end, Charlie. So away we go. We line up. He goes over the church. It was about, well, I imagine, nine. 30, 9, 9, 30 in the morning there. He peels off and dive bombs the church. So we're playing follow the leader. Oh, no. Number two man. <laughs> peels off and dive bombs the church. Oh, did they and me, I dive bomb the church and we go up and circle twice and then head for I'm not sure, Missouri. Did they think it was the Japanese? They didn't know. But anyhow, you never saw a church evacuate like that. <laughs> <laughs> but it sure did, and we were going along, and... <laughs> so this was a Sunday? This was a Sunday morning. <laughs> How can you imagine inside? Probably thought they and, were... uh, oh, yeah. a lot of praying going on. <laughs> and we were flying along, and uh, Kansas City came on, and told us to land immediately. Oh. <laughs> so we went about to land at Kansas City. We were in route to Nash, Missouri. You're kidding. No, uh, uh We went on to Nam. But I anyhow, we called for Nam Nash for landing permission. We circled. We coming in on our final approach, and I noticed all these damn jeeps lined up along the road. Oh, no. We touched down, and the jeeps get in the parade and follow us in, and the guys are standing up in the back and this way and this way. And I thought we were all going to jail. Did we ever get chewed out? I... Uh, I thought I thought my career was over. I really did. <laughs> and the funny thing then, the priest of, of the Episcopal priest here in town, Father Patrick General, has served at Nob Noster. I mean, he's been, he's on active duty, but he's now retiring next year. But when I when I found out about Nob Noster, I always remembered that that Sunday. But Anyhow, I grew up around Sedalia. Oh yeah, I know just down the road. I know where Sedalia. Yeah, when you Back said I'm not. Property at Sullivan, Missouri. But anyhow, and now wait, how old were you when you took off in this plane? When I, when I, when I was flying then. Yeah, when you, when you when dive you, bombed the church, how old were you? Oh, I wasn't 21 yet. I was <laughs> 21 until November. <laughs> Can you just see the testosterone going? <laughs> Here we go. I've got. <laughs> Three, please. I can just see. Oh, oh no! Oh. No, I'll tell you. It was, it, no, I see. I was born in forty and twenty, nineteen twenty. Yeah. Okay. I just was wondering how old you were when you <laughs> when you're doing that. Oh no! And then off we go to England, and we fly from uh, Scotfield. <laughs> to Prescott, Maine, to, uh, be, to fuel up. Because, see, they hadn't even gotten the Bombay tanks in, in those planes yet. Then we had to stop in uh, uh, Iceland to refuel again in, in Reykjavik, and then on to England. To the southern part Have of England. Have you ever flown that length, that much distance? Uh, oh, yeah, but I've never flown them that much distance together over water. Right. <laughs> yeah. Hawaii, you flew, you know what I mean? But, uh, oh uh, but never. Uh, and what was the crew? The crew? You mean how many? How many? Uh -huh. Okay, I had a co pilot, a nose gunner, 
Radio Man Waste Gunner? Another Waste Gunner? Uh, on the deer, of course, I told well, you. I don't know what a Waste Gunner is. That's in the waist of the plane. The bubbles on the side oh, of the plane, you call them a Waste Gunner. Oh, okay. They had guns that went out there? Yeah. Oh, okay. And then your tail gun. But the Radio Man was also a Waste Gunner? Radio Man was a Radio Man and a... And a, and a Waste Gunner, uh, too. But you had another Waste Gunner, too. Oh, well, you had two Waste Gunners. Yeah, okay. I just want to get it right. Yeah, he, uh, your, your waist gunner was your, the upper, mm -hmm. the, uh, the upper turret was, was your radio man gunner. Okay. So your waist gunners were waist gunners. Your radio man had a combo job. Okay. Okay. Plane. <laughs> oh, yeah. But anyhow. Now we were flying over, uh, we were flying over Europe in just a few days after we got there. Now, I'll tell you something else. The American Red Cross, they don't get a dime of my money. You're like my dad. <laughs> oh. Never get mine either. Really? Oh, no. I tell you, they were nothing but the biggest scam going in the world. We used to come back from, you know, see, we bombed in over Europe. We bombed in the daylight. See, the English said you couldn't. The losses would be horrendous. Mm -hmm. Flying bomber formations over Europe in the daylight, and they bombed to the Lancasters at night. So we bomb in the daylight, and I don't give a dog on what hour of the day we got back, or if it was even dark, raining and snowing. We touch those planes down, taxi them in, park them, head for the debrief shack. And outside the debrief shack is the Salvation Army. Hey, Yank, coffee, donuts. They would never take the money, and I wouldn't care what the weather was. So I get hurt, and I'm hospitalized in, in England, and I'm brought back. I brought to Fletcher General Hospital in Cambridge, Ohio. I have to be an officer, so I'm in an officer ward with other officers, you know. And uh, so, because I was ambulatory at that time, see, there was no requirement for a private room. I mean, the military isn't. They they spend money, but they don't they don't waste it particularly during that time. So, but they had a diet kitchen there on the with the on the, each of the officers' ward had its own diet kitchen. It was always stocked with cold meats and fruit and things and so on. You know, edibles. And uh, they uh, I got off the story about the Red Cross. Let me come back to the Red Cross a minute. Well, anyhow, we were listening to the radio and hit parade. I got so many stories. <laughs> my kids have heard them. My grandkids have heard them. But anyhow, I talk about the fun things. I don't want to talk about her. But they, they come on the hit parade and they say, we have just, I forget how many thousand cigarettes to the boys. They always call them the boys, you know, at Fletcher General Hospital. So we guys are down on the board here. We're going to wander up to the Red Cross and get some free cigarettes. So we truck our way up there. I put my hand in and get about five, eight, ten cigarettes. I don't remember. I didn't count them. Neither did the other guys. We started to walk away, and the Red Cross lady in her uniform says, That'll be uh, ten cents, please. For what? For the cigarettes. I said, You got them free. Ten cents, or else put the cigarettes back. We threw them back. The next, uh, and then a few days later, we're all sitting in the diet kitchen, talking, and here comes a crew, another crew, with another Red Cross lady and several more civilians down to talk to the boys. So they walk down the ward, and the Red Cross lady stops, and she talks to the guy that happened to be in the first quartermaster in Iran and got wounded in the groin area. 
and uh, does it hurt me? How'd you get hurt, Major? Does it hurt, Major? You know, what in the hell business is there with anybody there? They'd go down, they'd ask the guys, you know. Uh, they'd talk to them and quiz them on how they got hurt. Now, who in the hell's business is that? Not the Red Cross. That's our doctors. Uh, and the charging, they just irritate the hell out of me. And I won't give them a dime. Now, the Salvation Army, different deal. You feel the same way about the Salvation Army? Yeah, they're okay. You nodded your head when he said you wouldn't give a dime to the Red Cross. What's your story? What's your story? You know, I never had anything like that because I wasn't in the, well, I was in the hospital in Guam, but uh, uh, I never had anything to do with the Red Cross. They, I just didn't care for them. I don't remember everything that took place. Yeah, and then when, when Lena's brother was killed in that mid-air bomber collision, they wanted to charge me to send a damn telegram to verify it for me. Hmm. Interesting. Well. Oh, no, so that's when I went and saw the chaplain. <laughs> Interesting. When did you go through North Platte? Which, do you mean, going, when did I go through North Platte? The first, okay, that was in 19, uh, let's see, It was in the December of January, which is right at, not too long after I reported for duty, but about, we'll say January to be on the safe side. Mm-hmm. Uh, 1941? 41. 41. Uh, 42. 1942, yeah. Then I was again back in North Platte a couple of years ago. First time I'd been back with my daughter and her husband, my grandchildren, they lived in and uh, I stopped to show my wife this the train station and uh, I met, a, met an old met, met an older woman there and I wanted to know if she had served in the canteen she said yes as a little girl and I was telling her I'll never forget my that I mean because I we came through. See, we were taking crews by east. Uh, I'd come back, and they gave me a, gave me some R and R. They occasionally, see, after 50 missions, you were you were automatically sent home. Normally, if, if things were okay, for some R and R for a couple of weeks, and then then you had. Do, the R and R was doing something for the air. Where did you live at in this country? In Where did I live at? Yeah. I was living in Missouri. Missouri, southern Missouri. That's where my mother was living. I was actually living before the war in Moline. See, my wife comes from Alito. My wife came from Alito. Yeah, and. Uh, had you in the in the book that we have it it talks about that you know some of the servicemen didn't know that north you know they would be told by other servicemen that they were coming to this place oh yeah did you know ahead of time before you got to the the depot that that this was going to happen or was that a surprise that, that was definitely a surprise it was a very pleasant surprise you see the north Platte. You see they had they were uh, union pacific was running those trains, those troop trains, were at double, at twin engine, you know, they had two locomotives pulling because they just come up over through the mountains. And they changed trains and all the crews there. And of course there was time element depending on many factors, whether it was 15 minutes or, or an hour. And uh, the people on the train, the the conductors, you know, and, and people inside the train coaches are told to spot my plan. And I'll never forget them. Our guys, my, the, the crews that I was in command of moving, we went, I'll never forget it. We got off the train and we went in and God, those people, I mean, they couldn't do enough, you know. Hey, cake, pie, 
cookies, you name it, they had it all. That's right. Something else. And, and fruit. And I didn't, I was talking to one of those ladies, and they were paying for all that stuff out of their own pocket. That's right. Not one tax dollar was used. And that's right. Really uh, no. Uh, and so all of our guys got together, and the whole group, of, we were dropping money. I mean, I, I had I had been real flush. I, I don't know where I got an extra 10 bucks from, but I had it, and I put it in there. And my, I don't know how much my those crews of mine put in, but they put in quite a bit, you know. But those women and, and people, they gave up. They used their own ration coupons for the sugar, the flour, the fats. Everything was rationed. And, and those people, those people deserve more accolades than they probably are getting, you know, or probably got many, much more. And, of course, they didn't expect anything in return. They never thought about it, anything in return. No, they did no. not. And it regardless of the day or night, I was told by one of the train crews, <clears throat> A train, a troop train came through and had to stop, you know, because they were changing crews. I don't care what time of day or night, there were people there. It's it's really phenomenal. It, it is. It's, you'd almost say that it was untrue, if, yep. except that you, you so know many, it is. You know, they, oh, yeah. they said they served over six million services. Yeah, I don't doubt I mean, that. that's... I don't doubt that. They were Yeah. Well, right. what, when you walked in, what, I mean, what would just describe your... Oh, just, uh... A lot of a lot of ladies there, and uh, and there was men there too. Was yeah. there yeah. like a long? What the pictures we've seen? There's like a long table with yeah. food on it. Is that's that the right. way it was? That's right. You walked in the main entrance, there. and and it was so surprising they didn't. You know, you could not pay for it. Oh no! Absolutely, could not pay. If for you it. if you reach, you started <laughs> up that table and started reaching your pocket, put give some money. Uh uh They give you the dirty selection. You know, like you just committed. <laughs> A crime. Mm -hmm. And there were all ages of women then? Oh, was it? there was little kids all if, it, if, if it was, of course, daylight hours or day, normal day hours. The little kids are helping their mothers and their mm -hmm. fathers, and all ages, teenagers. Well, we, one thing we read, or she, when Virginia went out and, and talked to them, was the servicemen loved the hard boiled eggs and the milk because they got powdered. Oh, oh yeah, milk and eggs, and they. Yeah. So apparently that was a big, yeah. big draw. Oh, I was lucky one time. There, they had some deviled eggs. Well, and another thing they said. They you weren't know, green either, were they? No, they were not. <laughs> <laughs> All the eggs overseas were green. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, gross. oh god. Yeah. I mean, the greenish cast to them. Uh -huh. <laughs> they were pretty hard to eat. Yeah. <laughs> but the, one of the things that amazed me is they said that, you know, back then, you couldn't just go to the grocery store and get mayonnaise or anything. I mean, they had to make the mayonnaise. They had to make the bread. They had to, you know, it wasn't the pickles. The, oh, yeah. There's not, it was it a was different a, world, you know. Yeah, they were doing for us what we were doing for them. Yeah, yeah. That, that was their philosophy. Yeah, that's true. They, they, no, they. <coughs> I was just a kid then. I was 18 years old. I turned turned 18 after I enlisted. And, uh, they they <laughs> they 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 sacrificed a lot, and some of them were, were quite elderly that were there. And I mean, they had, but they were they were there because they wanted to show their appreciation. That's right. Well, they one in the book it says that you know there were like you were just set barely 18 that. A lot of the men had never been away from home before. Oh, no. Never, you know, and here they are in this home-like environment again, you know, and it just really had a tremendous oh. impact. Well, you them. saw some guys that were getting a little teary-eyed with some of these old, older women who were talking to them, you know, and mm -hmm. reminding them of their mothers or grandmothers or their sisters or something. Mm -hmm. Well... Did you jitterbug? Huh? Did you jitterbug with somebody? No, I didn't do any dancing. Well, they said they had a piano in there, and sometimes they... Oh, yeah. Yeah, they... Uh, they're, they're, I don't remember, remember anybody playing the piano when we were there, but they... Uh, it's been a long time ago. They yeah. were really, really <laughs> wonderful people. Yeah, 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 you have to. But uh, it takes all kinds, you know, to... Well, I was there in 1945. Yeah. 
quite a while after he was. Well, tell us about your uh, experience in the military. Well, I just, uh, <clears throat> I enlisted. I dropped out of school, high school, and enlisted in the Navy. When was that? 1945. Uh, Roosevelt was still president. He was still alive. Yep. And uh, I enlisted, and I never got called up until because of, right away because of his death. And then I <coughs> went to boot camp in the Navy over at uh, Great Lakes in yeah. Chicago. And uh, uh, the war was actually, they, they dropped the bombs just as I got out of boot camp. So I wasn't overseas when, at that point in time. But I'm thankful that they did all this because I probably wouldn't be sitting here today had they not because we were getting ready for the invasion of Japan. Yeah, yeah. That was my brother was in the tanks. He was in the Philippines. He fought in the Battle of the Philippines, you know. And they were on ships ready to go to Japan. And when VE Day hit, or VJ Day, I'm sorry, and uh, of course the ships never left the port to, to go to Japan, which was lucky for him. But, no. So you after boot camp then, then where did you go? I went to, uh, that's when I went to South Pacific. Oh, okay. Long Island. Not Long Island. Long Beach? Pardon me? Long Beach? No, no, San Diego? No. North Platte? Uh, what time are you talking about? North Platte. North Platte. Yeah. yeah. That's when I went through North Platte. Well, we... <coughs> I went back. I had a nine-day leave. And I went back to OGU outgoing unit there in, uh, at the uh, Naval Training Center. And uh, another fellow and I got an eight-hour liberty and we went into Milwaukee we met a couple of girls, had dinner with them, and we made dates with them for Saturday night. Okay, then, then we had, we couldn't, uh, it was every other day that we had an eight-hour liberty, so then our next day at our liberty, we went into uh, Chicago, met a couple of girls, <laughs> had, had you know, some refreshments with them, everything was on the up and up. And uh, we made days with them for the same night. <laughs> well, come that Saturday night, I was on my way to South Pacific. <laughs> I got to see either one of them. <laughs> but we, uh, uh, we we left Chicago then on the trip train, and we went to Kansas City, and that's where we picked up the Union Pacific. And we went up to uh, North Platte. But I remember, one thing I specifically remember, was when we were leaving, you know, they had changed engines or whatever yeah. they had to do. And uh, they blew the whistle, and that meant you better get out of there, out of that canteen, and <laughs> get on the train. So we ran, and they, they were moving, and we ran out. And there's this one little short guy. He just ran as fast as he could, and the engineer was just playing with him. <laughs> he, he just kept the engine, the train just a little bit ahead of him. We were in the last coach. <laughs> I was, anyway. Just kept the... Uh, a little bit ahead of him, finally slowed down, I'd catch up. <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody was saying, I don't know, you, you told me, I don't know who it was from, that they had this fellow who, who had beer in his in his car trunk and he would sell beer to the, sir, was that you that told yeah, me that? Yeah, there's a man down in uh, Nauvoo who said that uh, oh, okay. it was either his grandfather or he knows, the man is originally from North Platte. And this man had a pickup truck and he'd always stock the back end of his pickup truck with beer. And as soldiers go off, he would tell them about it. And then they'd just donate some money. And he always came out ahead. <laughs> Did you hear, ever hear about that story? No, I've never drank a beer in my life. So. Oh, okay. okay. Well, I didn't know. I just heard <laughs> no, this, this, I'm this not too good story. I, just, I used to bottle the picnics beer, the distributor here in town, and deliver beer when I was 16 years old in the summertime. And uh, they used to set a bottle, uh, draw a glass of beer and set it up for me, and I'd say, no, thanks. They got to where they set up the bottle of popcorn. Oh. <laughs> but I just couldn't get it past my nose. <laughs> so you lived in Burlington? I lived in West Burlington. West Burlington, okay. Well, what was the atmosphere like with the servicemen in the train when you're, I mean, was there just quiet or, oh. or trying to get their mind, your mind off things? or what? We just talked about everything under the sun. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in, the, in the car that I was in, there was a uh, police officer from uh, over in Ohio somewhere, and all these guys were from over east. Uh, and, uh, but they'd been drafted. And uh, 
headed to the South Pacific you know, along with me. I don't know where they, I, I suspicion they probably went to boot camp. I don't remember. There's so many things you talked about, you don't remember everything. Right. But they, I think they probably went to uh, Great Lakes also. But uh, they, they were, had all kinds of professions. Now these people, most of them were drafted because they were quite a bit older than me. But I didn't want into the Army. And I didn't want to get drafted in there. So I enlisted in ahead of time. And, uh, because you knew when you hit 18 you were going to get drafted. Probably, yeah. And I would have been. You, you see, you could tell from the man's serial number, too, Army serial numbers, whether he was enlisted for National Guard or drafted. Is that right? Yeah. The number one, in the case of my enlisted serial number, indicates I enlisted from the 6th Corps area. I wonder how the Navy had something like that. I didn't. They, they used to, but they don't anymore. Number two indicated that you were a member of the National Guard, and then the second digit indicated your core area that they came from. And number three indicated that you were a draftee. You could list at a serial, look at a man's serial number, mm -hmm, and, know. and know whether he was enlisted, guard, or, or drafted. Now, I don't know, now my son was the engineer on the submarine in Los Angeles. In fact, he's a plank over. He was a slant of the uh, Los Angeles when it was under construction in Newport. He's a nuclear engineer out west now and at, uh, at the Hanford Reservation. Uh, but, uh, of course, he served in peacetime. Of course, they called peacetime, but they were chasing the Russians all over yeah. submarines and submarines, you know. <laughs> right. But anyhow, no, it. Uh, well, I'll tell you this about my military. I wouldn't take a million dollars for it. And I've said that before, and I'll say it until I die. But I wouldn't want a million. I wouldn't go through it for another million. Mm -hmm. I feel the same way. I've it, always said that. It, it, it does. Now, you get. You, you get a com camaraderie, like in your outfit, you had you had some guys that you were really close to, they were like brothers. <laughs> Same way with, with my squadron, and particularly my crew. See, I named my plane, lovely Lena, <laughs> my wife's name. And sometimes if some guys are new come in or we go flying out with another squadron, they call over and they say, who the hell is lovely Lena? And I'd come on and I'd say, this is Colonel, if I was a Colonel at that time, this is Colonel Cobbin, and that's my girlfriend. <laughs> and then the, the radio would go silent. <laughs> well, I just, uh, I never got past uh, seaman first class, but uh, I took the test for a ship fitter third, and uh, when I was on Guam, and they uh, uh, called me up one day and said, uh, we're going to give you the ship fitter third. But you got to sign over in four more years. I told them what they could do with it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I won't tell you what I told them. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I always, I can understand that. I tried to have my squadron a cohesive body, list of men and officers, and I always I had an. I tried to meet with the entire squadron at least every two weeks, and sometimes you couldn't do it. See, now, I'm, I'm ignorant as far as um, a squadron is... A squadron is a group... How many? Uh, nine, a number? nine planes. Nine planes, okay. And sometimes it went to 18. Sometimes it went to 20. But originally when it was designed, it was to be nine. Okay. Three flights of three. But it, but I used to tell my men, you know, who the most important people are in this one. You get all kinds of answers. The navigator, or the radio man, or the bombardier. I say no. The enlisted man. Do you realize, guys? We'd never be off the ground if it wasn't for that enlisted man mechanic or the armorer or the guy repairing the engines or the radio. We'd never get off. And I said, and I want you to know another thing. 
color of skin doesn't mean anything. God gave us all brains. Black, white, red, green, yellow, you name it. But if you don't use them, he's going to take it away from you. Now, just because a man has got a different color than you doesn't mean he can't think and learn. I was proud of my squad. I was proud of my men. And uh, they always knew when the guys were from 727. I mean, it had been around a lot because we try, I tried to instill them, instill in them that they're there to serve their country, to serve each other, and to take care of their country, and to take care of each other. Because I felt that, and I really believed in it. Do you think if Pearl Harbor hadn't happened, I mean, I know it's just guessing, but do you think we would have just really held back and not gotten in? Uh, no, I, if, I think that we would have been in I, I think we would have because, number one, we were working with Lynn Lease because Hitler had to be stopped. And uh, it was only a matter of time because he was, it's, it's similar to what's going on now. He was bringing in saboteurs and everything else off of, uh, by submarine. We had, bomb, we had explosions here in the United States that were set off by German saboteurs. Really? I don't remember reading about that. Do you? Well, there's a lot of stuff that went on that you don't, and to <coughs> be quite honest with you, President Roosevelt, I think, knew what was going to happen. Oh, I think oh, so. Oh, well, uh, I, 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 I read it. Well,